Welcome back to MTG Budget Magic. I gotta ask you an important question, people. Are you ready to get Riach? Quick tangent. Riach is not actually rich. Riach is like when you get 20 bucks, but you've always been broke, so you think you're rich. That means you're Riach. That's what we're gonna work on today for all you people who have a whole five dollars and three nickels to rub together. We're gonna try to get Riach. So, to sum up our first video, as some of you already have on the uh, Reddit thread that we published for the previous video, basically in part one we talked about playing in player run Penny Dreadful events. You end up grinding up enough cards and a few tickets and then you move your way up to the popper casual leagues that are online. I'll just show you real quick. If you go to the play lobby on Magic Online, construct tournaments, leagues, Look around here and see we go friendly popper league. There you go. You need you need basically eight tickets and a deck to get started. If it doesn't go well, well then you're relegated back to the salt mines. By salt mines I actually meant the, the penny dreadful uh, player run leagues. They're not actually as bad as the salt mines. I, I joke. Anyway, so that's pretty much it. Eventually you build up enough wealth where you can start playing in the challenge events on the weekend, which have pretty nice EV and you're going to want to get... You don't necessarily have to delve into all of the different formats, but you want to have access to, ideally, if you're just going to grind like a mad person, you don't have any desire to go do anything else on the weekend or any day of the week as far as that goes. If you really want to dive in and just max, min-max everything, then you'll want to have a few other formats, perhaps a commander deck, uh, maybe a, a legacy or a modern or a standard or something, although standard's really not great EV for the challenges. Although if you want to dink around with the with the friendly standard league, you can do that if you can find some kind of budgety deck to put together, that's just fine too. Anyway, eventually you basically end up spreading out and then at some point you really want to be investing slash speculating because you've only got so much of your own time that you can spend playing in various leagues and events and tournaments and all that. Whereas you can start utilizing your extra tickets to be passively making you more tickets if you can invest in the proper ways. And you can actually get started with that fairly early. You, any extra tickets that you have that you know you don't necessarily need to have access to for a few months can really go to work and do some good stuff for you. We're going to talk about that today. Today we're primarily going to talk about how you can invest appropriately. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how to make a, an intelligent and informed decision about what deck to pick up in Popper once you're bridging the gap from the Penny Dreadful Leagues and you've got to invest in a deck. Obviously this is an important decision because there's a big step up in cost probably from your Penny Dreadful decks to your first Popper deck so you're going to want to pick the right deck so I can give you some guidelines for what you might look at. Next we'll talk about some investments and some, some good ways to uh, make some good returns doing some cheap investments even if you've only got two or three tickets to work with. Lastly we'll talk about some site navigation on the client and we'll talk about trading with bots and we'll talk about how to really squeeze out every last nickel when you're trading with bots. So let's go ahead and uh, let's divert ourselves real quick to talking about how to evaluate your first popper deck. So again going back you've been grinding you've been grinding penny dreadful league events I don't know days weeks months whatever it may be and you've been slowly accumulating cards and tickets well let's say tickets because well uh, maybe you don't want to necessarily pick up a few rando cards you really want to accumulate all of your resources so that you can go all in on one deck at some point you don't want to have a few cards for one thing and a few cards for something else. Again, you got to be very careful about how you spend your tickets. So here we have the the Popper metagame uh, here on the MTG Goldfish website. This place is your best friend. You just go to MTG Goldfish, click decks, metagame, Popper, boom, here we are. Now, the way that, that uh, MTG Goldfish does this is they'll show you all of the decks uh, that have at least 2% metagame share. Keep in mind these numbers aren't completely accurate because a lot of the, the data is hidden from us. Wizards only share so much information. But who cares about all that? 
uh, you can basically rely on this to make a decision about the stuff that's between tier one and tier two. Now, if you click view more, there's a whole lot of other decks you can look at. But we don't want to get too fringe. We don't want to get too cute for our first deck. So suffice it to say, you're going to be sticking to a deck that has at least a 2% metagame share, just to be careful. So let's go back here and make sure. Oh, geez, looks like we cannot undo Pandora's box now that I've expanded the list to include every obscure deck. There's no going back. All right, one thing, unfortunately, we do have to consider is price. So we've got these different price points, and there can be a big difference. For example, there's a big difference between 20 tickets and, uh, you know, 120 tickets, right? So you want to make sure that you're making a reasonable budget decision. All right, the first thing you have to do is think about what kind of what kind of style you naturally play. If you're a player that has a wide range of different types of decks that you enjoy playing, then you know, you can you can kind of uh I guess just kind of pick and choose freely, but most people have a certain style of deck that they're most comfortable with. Now, you might end up playing this deck a lot. So it's really important that you pick up a deck that falls within your sphere of comfort as far as the style of play. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't care about all that. Just tell me what the best deck is. The metagame evolves. Popper is a very fluid format. People were having a conniption fit with Is It Delver being at the top of the format, so dominant that it would never fall. We're probably going to have to have a ban. And, and now where is it? Oh. Oh, okay, there it is, number four. <laughs> Almost couldn't find it. There's so many other decks that are sliding up ahead of it. So the metagame is very fluid. Uh, something might appear to be at the top for several months, but there's, there's going to be adjustments. Things are going to change. So don't get fixated on the quote-unquote best deck. Instead, you want to find a good, solid deck that you can just kind of grind with over time and stick with and learn all the ins and outs because really knowing how to min-max the matchups, the sideboarding, the interactions between different decks is huge. Popper's a very grindy format and learning how to really just, just get every inch of value out of your play is really important. So as you can see, there's different types of, of decks. Koldothoboros is a mid-range deck that has a lot of controlling elements. It's sort of controlly mid-range, but it does have a little bit of aggression that it can put at you. If you like playing something that's mid-range and grindy, I highly suggest this as an option. If you want to go with something that's a little more aggressive, then your options right now are basically Burn, Affinity, and Elves. Also, sort of kind of boggles. This is a very non-interactive... Uh, it's, it's a lot like the uh, Hexproof Boggles deck in Modern, if you're familiar with that. You play critters with hexproof, you put a bunch of enchantments on them, and you go to the dome. So if you want to play something more aggressive, burn, affinity, boggles, and elves are good options. I've made videos of all of these different decks here on my channel, breaking them down. So if you want more detail on how these decks play and interact, then feel free to browse through my channel and find those. If you want something that's a little more mid-rangey, right now, Koldothoboros and Tron are probably your best bet. If you want something that feels a little more combo-ish, then Inside Out Combo and Is It Blitz are probably your best bet. Uh, if you do not want to play Koldothoboros but you want something mid-range, uh, Tron is kind of mid-range. It's also sort of a lockdown deck, depending on what style you're playing. It's either control or lockdown. There's a lot of different Tron lists. They can be very powerful. You can also get some crazy nut draws. You can also just have some hands that don't go anywhere because your Tron doesn't come together. You don't get enough colored mana. So again, it just depends on your tolerance for these kind of situations. The various Delver decks that you'll see are tempo decks. They, they tend to be a little bit on the more pricey end of the scale. As you can see here, blue-black control is super cheap. It's an option you can try out. Uh, I, I don't know how I feel about it right now because I, I feel like it's, it's, uh, it's been struggling a little bit with, with its position, but people still have success uh, with, uh, with blue-black control from time to time, so it's not terrible. If you wanted, if you if you feel like you are really good with control decks, it's a place you could start on the reasonably cheap. 
I do recommend blue black control over mono black control just because I think that having access to the blue makes a big difference. I think blue black control basically does what mono black control does. It just it just does it better by and large. So uh, elves is also this is a highly synergistic deck. There's a ton of sideboard hate that's going to be coming at you. If you play elves, basically there's a lot of sweepers that people are going to board in. But if you enjoy elves, if you enjoy a very synergistic sort of kind of combo-ish, but not really combo kind of deck, then, then that's something you can try out. Uh, I mean that 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 pretty well covers the options. Uh, white black pestilence. I think this is actually a decent deck you could you could try. It's very grindy, very controlly. Uh, goblins is not not bad. Uh, at various times, it can actually be quite good. I do not recommend mono white heroic. I do not recommend slivers. Stompy is actually not bad a lot of the time. Uh, right now, it actually has a pretty bad time against burn. Cold off the Boros can be a, a difficult matchup. Affinity can be a difficult matchup. It, there's just a lot of things that can be tough, but but Stompy is typically not bad and for 18 tickets when you're able to. It it's it's worth. One of the things I really want to stress: whatever deck you end up trying out, do not sell your cards if if you can at all help it. A, a lot of the cards that you'll find. In, in one popper deck carry over to another popper deck and you just end up getting hammered on the on the margins whenever you're buying and selling cards. Let me just show you an example. Lightning Bolt is a card that is played in a bunch of different decks. Uh, let's find just a regular version of Lightning Bolt to make a... Alright, Masters 25 Lightning Bolt. So Right now, dollar twenty-seven online. You can get it from MTGO Traders for for one point two seven tickets, and then it's not even showing up what the current buy list would be. Let's see if we can find a different Lightning Bolt. Maybe we can find a buy list. Okay, here we go. Masters ma the Masters Edition Lightning Bolt is one point eight six tickets, and the buy list is one point two. So there's a spread of thirty five percent. This is not uncommon for there to be a you know pretty fat spread. 35% is quite a bit between what you're going to pay for a card and what a bot is going to give you back for that card. So Bolt goes into a lot of different popper decks. You don't want to sell that back and then be buying it back later. If the deck that you're trying out doesn't work out, I know it's a grind, but you're going to go back to Penny Dreadful and you're going to keep grinding until you can get your next deck. Eventually this will will really pay you off because you're going to be able to accumulate a base level of cards where you're when you start building new popper decks you'll already have half or two-thirds of the deck from other decks that you've built that's that's a lot of fun I also highly recommend that you if you are able to have success when you start grinding your popper leagues save your tickets so that at some juncture when you've absolutely had enough of grinding your current deck you can accumulate enough tickets to be able to grind into other things. I should also mention when you're grinding leagues your winnings are going to be in the form of treasure chests. Do not open them no matter how tempting it may be. You take the treasure chests and you go sell them for tickets. Yes you could open your treasure chest, yes you could get lucky, but on the averages you're going to be better off to just sell your treasure chests, take the tickets, and invest in what you actually need. Even at times when the treasure, the treasure chests appear to have good value, the problem is uh, the cost, what you can actually get for the treasure chest itself, usually the margins are much better than when you go to sell the cards in the treasure chests. So I don't even know if we've got, let's, yeah, I guess it would help if I could spell. So right now, treasure chest, okay, we don't have any information here, but we can actually just go into the MTGO client, take a quick look at treasure chests. I'm going to look at uh, Booster City as a bot that I deal with for treasure chests. Their rates are usually pretty well on the market. So you can see that they sell treasure chests for 2.58 tickets, and they buy them for 2.55 they have a three cent spread. That is a super tight spread. So you're getting just very close to full value out of those treasure chests when you're turning them into tickets. Whereas if you open a treasure chest, it's going to have some random cards that you can find. If you want to look at the treasure chest contents, it's very random. There's lots of different stuff. Just look up treasure chest contents on Google and dig around and you can you can go digging through it. But the problem is going back to 
what we were looking at as far as the spread on lightning bolt this kind of stuff isn't uncommon for there to be big spreads on cards so even though you might get all excited that you opened up 10 treasure chests and you feel like you did better than if you had sold the treasure chests the problem is once you take the the big spread hits a lot of the time even if you're winning quote unquote you would have been better off to just sell the treasure chests. I mean you really gotta kill it with some really valuable cards to be able to do better than just selling the treasure chests. and statistically over the course of time this is just not gonna happen so sell the treasure chests. moving along let's go ahead and bounce over and let's talk about some some speculation slash investing let's say you're playing in penny dreadful leagues you're having a good time you're not in a rush to go over to, to grinding popper leagues or let's say you're grinding popper and you're not in a big hurry to invest in a new deck you've got some extra tickets you've been making and you want to put them to work whatever your situation let's say you've got five tickets to put to work you don't have 10 20 30 40 50 tickets you got five tickets and you need to really max that out all right, well, what we need to do is we need to find some cheap cards that have big upside and not too much downside. I want to give you a quick example. Field of Ruin is a card that has been pretty cool for me. I was picking these up for a nickel and then selling them for 50 cents, and I still have a stack of them. I, I think I bought some obscene amount, like 100 copies or something when they were really cheap. I've still got 28 left. I'm trying to time it to where, I don't know, maybe if I could get 75 cents right now, they're 77 cents online. I could go ahead and buy, list them for 62 cents, and I'd be doing really well because, again, I got them for a nickel. Uh, I've already sold a bunch of them for 50 cents. The one thing you got to be careful about with a card like Field of Ruin is that it is precisely the kind of card that Wizards likes to release as a promo. If this gets released online as a promo, its value goes to zero. So there's always that kind of risk with these kind of cards. What we want though, basically, is we're looking for really cheap rares or uncommons that could be broadly adopted, ideally multiple copies in multiple different decks. Standard cards tend to have the best margins and the most volatility, which is kind of what we're after. Field of Ruin is also interesting because if you look, this is a card that you could have bought at 20 cents and it rose up to 40, probably weren't it oh, rose up to 60 cents maybe you could have gotten 50 cents there you buy in at like 25 cents you get up to 50 you sell out when it's at 60 cents maybe you can get 50 cents at that time with the spreads and you basically double your money then it rides back down you buy in again at like 25 cents and then it rides back up to 80 cents you sell out again whenever you can get 50 cents again and just double your money again so you can see this this is something where let's see here between the the bottom on 82 and the next top on 85 over the course of 3 days you you probably could have doubled up your 5 tickets to 10 and then between 89 and 817 basically in less than 10 days you could have done it again probably now here if you were waiting for it to get down into the 20 you know the quarter range it just never gets there so we never get a chance to get really get back in ever again and who knows if that will ever happen again it may very well be that once it gets down to 30 35 cents if it ever gets there you know even you may just have to go with that um, I don't know maybe maybe even 40 cents is a get in point if it when it dips down again but when you see these big dips make sure it's just random volatility really check the news make sure there hasn't been an announcement of any promos because again that kills the value and they never recover how do you find more cards like field of ruin that you can look at first of all again you want to look at primarily you know there's different strategies you can use for what i would suggest stick to standard stuff for example let me just show you real quick preordains a card i had some fun speculating with because look at this crazy volatility where you could just buy it and sell it over and over but one of the problems with this card is the 56 percent spread right it's worth 34 cents they'll give you 15 cents this is actually not a bad point to buy in on preordain the problem is to actually make money on this card it's gotta it's gotta like more than double just for you to make a few dimes because popper cards get murdered on the spreads this is one of the reasons why it's it's good typically to stick with standard stuff also it can take a really long time and you never really know for sure where these things are going to go but if you look you can see it's it wouldn't be crazy for preordain to pop back up to a full ticket value it's done it many many times and it wouldn't be unprecedented for it to do it again as you can also see preordain 
is that it's really at its at its at its low. So this is not a bad time to to go deep on preordain if you're feeling frisky. But just know that the the margins are bad and it can take a long time to get to a nice exit point. I do prefer standard cards if you are in a hurry to try to maximize your profits. All right. Having said that, where where can you go to get some other ideas? All right. First of all, I want to. There's a site called Quiet Speculation. These people are basically magic investment gurus. You've probably heard of them if you're big on MTG Finance. If you haven't, it's just know that it's a pay site. So to to get access to all the Quiet Speculation content, there's actually a monthly fee. However, they have unlocked content you don't have to pay for from time to time. There's an article by Kyle Rusiano. I'm probably butchering that name. I apologize. I'm going to link this into my show notes. And he talks about uncommons from Core 19. And it's pretty interesting. He talks about recent uncommons that he had done well with. And as you can see, the type of commons he's investing in, Field of Ruin, Unclaimed Territory, If Near Deadlands, we have three out of the eight cards are land. You know, if you see a good uncommon land that might be playable and it's cheap, you know, around, you know, a nickel to 15 cents, that's something that should get your attention. Thrashing Brontodon with double green was really a limited card that may have been unlikely to get there, but it did. These other cards, Abraid, Doomfall, Cast Out, these are just general and, you know, generally... Uh, wide versatile removal options that have a single color restriction and are fairly cheap-ish I guess by standard uh, by standard standards today. Supreme Will, a versatile card filtering counterspell also a single blue. This kind of stuff is what we're looking for and he's got a little spreadsheet where he talks about different stuff. He also previews cards that he thinks might have a chance to get somewhere. He highlights Shield Mare, Dryad Green Seeker, Plague Mare, Militia Bugler, Stitcher Supplier, and Vine Mirror. So these are some cards that I don't even know what their prices are at, but if they're super cheap, if they're nickels, then you might pick up, you know, eh, you know, since we've only got a couple of tickets to work with, I, I think personally I would stick with Militia Bugler, Stitcher Supplier, and Vine Mirror only if they're below a nickel. If they're pennies, that's perfect. I wouldn't want to go deeper than, you know, it depends on how much money you have. Like some, you know, in my particular situation, if they're at a nickel, you know, I'll pick up 50 or 100 copies, but if you just have a little bit to work with, you want to diversify your investment portfolio. It's the same philosophy as investing in stocks or any or bonds or anything like that. So if you've only got a couple of tickets, I would say probably limit yourself to uh, 20 or 30 cents of value, even on these fairly reasonable upside kind of cards. You also have to know that there's no telling how long it takes for these cards to pop up. And we're, we're looking to ideally see them go up over a quarter, maybe even 50 cents. But you also have to keep in mind if you get stuck holding something and you're getting close to the end of its standard life, you definitely want to bail and try to get any of your money back that you can if possible. Another thing you can check out is MTGO Traders on YouTube. Just do a YouTube search for MTGO Traders, check out their videos. The MTGO finance report is particularly what we're talking about. That was actually what keyed me off to picking up Field of Ruin. I didn't realize they were down to a nickel. And on one of the finance videos that they did, they mentioned Field of Ruin looked like a pretty solid pickup at a nickel. And I was like, oh yeah, I think that they nailed it. So from time to time, they've got some really good random shout outs for things you can pick up. And that's another great place to go. Another thing you can do is you can just go to metagame, go to standard, and just pull up some deck lists and start looking at all the different deck lists and see if you see any common threads of cards that are seeing. No, we don't care about commons. Ideally, we want cheap rares or uncommons. And if you see a, a cheap rare or an uncommon that's seeing a lot of play in a lot of different decks, but it's not particularly expensive, that could be a good place to go. However, be careful about anything that's been reprinted a whole lot of times. What we really want is something that's rare or an uncommon, is seeing play in multiple copies, in multiple decks. Multiple formats is a bonus, but we don't have to get that greedy. It has only been printed once. That's what we're looking for. Or maybe twice. So again, if you go back and we go back to this Quiet Speculation article, 
we see all of these cards listed here that were successful uncommons for investing purposes for this person. These were all first time print copies. These were not reprints. Having said that, there's actually, if, if you look at Clifftop Retreat, for example, I picked up a pretty big stack of these around a quarter and they're up at 89 cents. I think that these will get over, I think I'll be able to get over a ticket apiece and, and make a really nice profit on these. So anytime, these check lands have been printed once before, the off color ones. So if you see one of the interesting things to look at on these, let's see here, these off color check lands, Hinterland Harbors at 50 cents and I think, I'm trying to see, I don't know for sure where they're all at, but just keep an eye on them. I'm kind of curious if the, if some of the ones that don't have their, uh, their, their guild represented yet sort of lag behind. Uh, Woodland Cemetery seems to be doing pretty good, but Golgari is out right now in the new guilds of Ravnica set. So let's see here. Let's maybe if we filter these by rarity and go down and check out the rare sulfur falls is up to two tickets this is another card that was, was a pretty nice pickup for a long time it was around a ticket and boom basically a, a double up the blue reds are always nice and woodland cemetery has not been as good clifftop retreat's been pretty sweet okay i'm kind of curious if isolated chapel trails off and I, I don't want to buy it at 50 cents. There's probably pretty good money to be made buying it even at 50 cents. But I would like to see this get a little bit cheaper. As ideally, if this just doesn't see much play, there's just not a ton of decks trying to utilize white and black together. If this trailed off to a quarter, oh, that would be sweet to pick up a huge stack of these. Because eventually, when its guild gets released, in the past, it's, it's not been crazy for white-black to be a very viable color combination and standard. And if it ever gets there, these will easily go over a ticket. And the spreads are usually tolerable on standard cards again. So st stuff like this you got to keep an eye Now, if you've only got a couple of tickets to work with, this may be above where you want to be. If you happen to have like 40 or 50 tickets, then going into stuff like this is not terrible, especially if you're willing to wait. So that's something else. But anyway, that's basically the idea is you can just kind of browse through, see what's starting to coalesce as some reasonably good targets that you can you can go in on. Okay, so that covers that. Now let's go ahead and talk about dealing with the bots. First of all, when you log in, you've got your home page, your collection. You're going to build your decks here. You can see, you know, standard. For your, for your Penny Dreadful decks, you're going to put those in free form, add a deck, you'll, you'll, you'll so like if you wanted to create a, a deck for Penny Dreadful, let's see, I should have an old Penny Dreadful deck here somewhere. Boom, here we go. If you want to find a card to add, you would just type it in right here, find it in your collection, drag it down here. You don't have to worry about saving anything because it, once you put a card in, it's saved automatically. Bada bing, bada boom. Okay. Play Lobby, this is where you're going to find games and such. And then Trade. If you go into the Trade, first thing, type in Free. For example, Dojo Trade Free. Free uh, bot giveaway 100% free cards courtesy of Dojo Trade Bots. Take up to 8 free cards per day. You'll notice some of these say, Free Trade! That's not. We're not looking for a trade. We're just looking for actual free cards. So there's the Dojo Trade Free Bot and card hoarder free bot get 64 free cards every day and there's a few others you can just go look through these and you'll find them okay go bots free bots there you go four free cards every day and mtgo traders free bots i don't know how many cards you can get every day but there's free free cards there you can get some really bad free cards if you're starting out brand new and you, you don't have any money to work with but you don't mind spending a little time, go pick up your free cards every day. Maybe you find something you can use in a Penny Dreadful or a Popper deck that's just a, a random lucky find. I don't know. Next up, I'm going to point you to the bots you need to know about. Most of you probably already know all these, but we've got the Goat Bots and then the MTGO Trader Bots. Mostly, then we've got Card Hoarder and Card Bot. Most of the time, I end up selling to card buying bot 
which is basically just Cardbot. And so you'll see there's these ones that have dashes. I don't know if those are legit or not, but I always sell to the ones that just have the regular numbers. I know those are real legit. And they, they tend to offer good rates. They tend to offer the best rates. I like to sell to these card buying bot. It's card buying bot. The numbered ones without the dashes. Those are the ones that I trust to get reasonably good prices when I sell stuff. When I'm buying stuff, a lot of times GoatBots has the best prices for buying things, and especially if you're dealing with cheap popper cards or penny dreadful cards. One of the things that's really nice, and this is something you need to know about, is the Goat GoatBots bulk. So right here you'll see selling 1,000 commons and 500 uncommons for a ticket. That is sweet. It's it's very common for me to find a card that GoatBots is selling for half a penny that would cost five pennies over at MTGO Traders or CardBot. Which, by the way, I like CardBot. I like MTGO Traders. I like selling stuff to them, and I buy actually buying mythics, mythic rares for them. Sometimes is that you can get better prices, but when it comes to buying really really cheap stuff, stuff where we're talking about pennies, I really like goat bots most of the time to give you the absolute bottom uh, bottom of the barrel dirt cheap rate for buying that kind of stuff so you're going to want to go there once you start getting into buying cards that are worth around a ticket or a play set of a card being worth a ticket you're going to want to look up and find the mtgo library so that's mtgolibrary.com click on wiki price this is just another thing to check to make sure you're getting the best possible price when you go to pick up something that might uh, be around a ticket for a playset. So I don't know what in the world I did here. Preordain M11. Here we go. So all sets only M11s, and here we go. I can the cheap. So this is just an a site. This is a particular type of bot. The MTGO library bots. Uh, all their all their bot information is aggregated on this one market website. And from time to time, before I'm going to go buy something where, again, the place that's going to run me at least a ticket, I like to check here just to make sure in case some rando bot might have a play set of something that's going to cost me, say, uh, the, the place that would cost me a buck twenty from goat bots or MTGO traders. And I find out that I can actually get the play set for. 98 cents from some random MTGO library bot and then I'll have a couple of random cents left over at that bot as well and uh, yeah it's just another another way to make sure you're getting maximum value I use this stuff from time to time let's see here it looks like I've got I've got 2.5 credits worth of random credits with different bots just because I, I don't I don't really worry about it too much a lot of times I'll pick up stuff for, you know, 80 cents when it would have cost me a dollar somewhere else and I'll have 20 cents left over for a rainy day, that kind of thing. That's another thing that you can you can take advantage of to try to save some money when you're shopping around. So basically you've got MTGO Traders, Goat Bots, Card Bot, MTGO Library, and Card Hoarders are kind of the places you want to remember as your go-tos. Now, when you're buying and selling cards, you're going to want to adopt one particular bot where you do a lot of business for just buying stuff where if the prices are the same across the board everywhere, you're going to want to have one bot you primarily deal with that you trust because you're going to have credits left over and when you're buying and selling stuff all the time, it is handy to be able to take advantage of having leftover credits somewhere that you use consistently. I would say when in doubt GoatBots is a reasonable place to buy from again and Card CardBot is a reason or MTGO Traders is a reasonable place to sell most of the time and selling to GoatBots can be fine a lot of the time too. Definitely definitely feel free to compare prices when it comes to selling treasure chests again. I like to sell to Booster City just because I've noticed they tend to always give competitive rates and I don't want to have to check every single time and uh, so yeah that's that's basically a breakdown for how you can handle your stuff so that's how you can get started doing the analysis for some of your very first speculative investments and 
also some methodology. There, I've got tons of deck breakdowns for lots of different popper decks on the channel uh, for when you get to that stage and you're ready to start evaluating a popper deck. And that's the flow. We go from Penny Dreadful, work our way into popper. We also want to have some speculative investing we're doing on the side. It's not fancy. It's not rocket science. This is not get rich quick or a magic pill. This is just good old fashioned grinding. But if you're if you're someone that, as I said during my last video, if you have a lot of time and not a lot of money and you're willing to put the grind in, you absolutely can build yourself a four figure, you know, thousand dollar plus account off of five, 10, 20 bucks just to get you launched. So hopefully this video series is gonna help you do that. And if you haven't subscribed and you've found anything useful in this content that I've put out, please go ahead and subscribe. I'm going to have a few other series of different types of videos slash podcasts I'll be putting out. Some of them having to do with the metagame for Popper and other Popper related content in general, as well as occasionally there will be some kind of budgety random thing that'll come out there. And then I might have some random hot takes I put out there for everybody as well. For now, this has been part two of how to turn your $10 into a $1,000 Magic Online account. And uh, tune in again next week when we talk about some of the other things you can do at the end of the road as far as uh, analyzing different types of events you can play in. We'll talk about the challenges a little bit. Also, we're going to jump way ahead in our timeline and we will talk about how eventually you can cash out. I think it's important for people to know the most efficient ways to get money into the Magic Online economy and the most efficient ways to get money out of the Magic Online economy. Most people do not do it the most efficient way, they do it the easiest way, which I can understand, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the easy ways, but we'll also talk about the most efficient ways to get money in and out, because it's, I haven't seen a lot of people talk about that kind of stuff. Anyway, until then, I hope that you're able to continue to grind and make money or store credit if you're playing with paper cards, playing Magic the Gathering. Peace!